Whether you agree or disagree with Ed and Lorraine Warren's personal views, you gotta admit they had a huge impact on the paranormal community of believers with all of the cases that they worked on during their very long and fascinating careers. But what about the cases they didn't get a chance to tackle? I have a feeling I know of a few where their expertise could have been beneficial. Question for you, what's your favorite case of theirs to chit chat about? Or if you aren't a fan, what's your least favorite and why? Let me know in the comments and let's dive into things. So, the Jones house was the home of the Jones family family who believed they lived with ghosts. And this all started on one evening in 1993 when the matriarch of the family, Denise, was preparing dinner and she heard her son Michael screaming like holy terror level. She went to his room and found him curled up, frightened, shaking, and well, screaming. He told her that he saw the face of a strange looking man smiling at him who touched his shoulder and then pff, disappeared. Poor little one was just this many years old, and this was the beginning of something that would last his entire life. Shortly after the incident, the family was at Denise's parents' house when Michael began yelling again. He told Denise and her parents that a man in a picture on the wall was the same one he had seen in his room. This was Denise's grandfather, who had died 17 years earlier and Michael had never met him. He'd also never seen a picture of him before. He soon felt better because he felt like his great-grandfather was watching over him. Then he claimed that evil spirits run the house and that they wanted to take him to their side. So Denise brought in a paranormal investigator. John Zaffis to investigate him and the house. And he's pretty sure that Michael's ghost sightings were genuine. Another ghost that Michael claimed to see was an evil spirit he called the Shadow Man, which was a darker apparition that looked like a shadow that Michael saw every day. Now, his family was like, okay, this is getting a little more dangerous. One night, his parents heard strange thumping noises, and they went up to his room and found his bed shaking violently. On another occasion, Denise saw a shadow of a six foot tall something or another that walked across a wall, which was apparently the Shadow Man. Then Michael claimed that the spirits were physically tormenting him with some physical harm, scratching, and biting. John believed that the spirits were about to possess the son, so Denise was like, okay, whole family's moving, out we go. But it didn't end there. These spirits followed the family. Denise was like, okay, um, how about an exorcism? I'll call the bishop. They got lucky. Bishop was like, yep, this needs to happen. And during the exorcism, he saw this shadow man at the church. The bishop had Michael drink holy water, which isn't a method I've heard about before. And the family was like, okay, well, if it helps, it helps. Well, it didn't. Three weeks later, here we go again. Michael underwent four more exorcisms. Now he still sees spirits, but his family's like, hey, maybe one day this is gonna stop. Look, I know Ed Warren would have known just what to do in this situation and ended it for once and for all. Just saying. Alrighty folks, time to travel over to Ireland with this legend. Look, if we know anything about Ed Warren, he loved investigating the legends of ghostly ladies haunting places, and this one is a doozy. Let's see if I get it right. Dirg Du is an Irish word for a female demon that seduces men and drains them of their life source. Iconic. The name literally translates to red consumer of fluids. Oh, well, you get what I mean. An Irish lady who was famous across the land for her beauty and who fell in love with a local peasant against her father's disapproval is said to have been the subject of a tale that originated in Celtic culture. Now, arranged marriages weren't uncommon back then, so centuries ago in the area that is now Waterford, a young girl with beauty so astounding that men were absolutely smitten with her, and woman wanted to be her, was happily living day to day and had the love of a farm laborer. They made plans to marry and have descendants of their own. Granted, her dad, who uh, wasn't a nice guy and cared nothing for love and innocence, was like, mm, no, arrange marriage for you because I want to promise your hand to a wealthy and notoriously atrocious person in charge with a lot of power in exchange for riches and lands for, well, myself and for all of my remaining offspring. So the marriage was arranged, the date was set, and all the begging in the world from our poor bride-to-be was not enough to move the cold, empty heart of her father or her betrothed. So on the day of the wedding, everybody dressed in their finery, and the bride was a vision of beauty, dressed in red, gold, and we're all gonna party throughout the night. But one person sat away from them all, damning her father and vowing to seek revenge on those who had cost her her love and life. Turns out this new husband with all this power, yeah, he was a little bit harmful. Well, a lot a bit harmful, and very controlling, more so than his new wife could have ever imagined. To him, this new wife was nothing but a trophy to be locked away for his pleasure only, savoring the knowledge that she was his and his alone. She was so depressed, I wonder why, so lonely with a complete absence of hope that she just wasted away, not drinking, not eating, just existing, her life gone long before her body gave in. Her burial was a modest affair, her husband had already taken another wife before she was, like, cold, like cold body. And her family was too much obsessed with their wealth and their greed to give her a second thought. One man did grieve though, her lost love. He visited her grave every single day, telling her of his undying love and praying for her return to his arms. Sadly, his love was not the driving force for her resurrection. Revenge was a force that pulled her from her grave on the first anniversary of her death. Consumed with anger and the need for retribution, she climbed from her coffin and headed straight to her parents' home. As her father lay sleeping, she touched her lips to his and sucked the life out of him. But 
that wasn't enough. She called upon her callous husband, finding him surrounded by a woman, fulfilling his lustful desires, and oblivious to the dead bride, and she launched on him, sending everybody else screaming. She was so full of fury and fire that she not only drew every breath, but drained every ounce of red fluid from his twisted and cruel body. Scarlet liquid surging through her, she felt more alive than she had ever been before, and she had a hunger that could not be uh, satisfied. So eager to satisfy this, the love who had wished her back to life was forgotten, and such was his good fortune, for he would have been another victim of her lust. Our corpse bride used her beauty to prey on young men, luring them to their demise with seduction, the promise of her body the reward. Instead, well, she sank her teeth into their exposed necks and drank their fluids to quench her thirst and desire, but it was never enough. The warm red elixir of life gave her strength and immortality, and she hungered for her next feast. The, her remains are buried in Waterford, in a place known as Strongbow's Tree. Her lustful yearning can only be satisfied on the day she died, so on the eve of her anniversary, locals gather and position rocks upon her grave so that she will not rise and take the elixir of the innocent. Sometimes the rocks are displaced, forgotten, or her desire is stronger than any stone could ever be, and she walks into the night, tempting folks to fall victim to her beauty and her lust. Look, I feel like Ed Warren could have absolutely put an end to this for once and for all, and probably should have visited this place before he passed, and acknowledged the legend. Do you mind if I cheat a little with the rest of today? Like, I found some cases that are definitely supernatural, but not necessarily hauntings, and I'm pretty sure Ed and Lorraine would have helped out greatly with these. Thanks, folks! So I'm a bit of an unsolved mysteries addict, and I immediately thought about the Up in Smoke episode from Season 9 when the powers at me asked me to talk about Ed and Lorraine today. So this episode examined three cases of spontaneous human combustion, two of which ended in death, with the third being that of Kay Fletcher, a woman who says that one morning her back started emitting smoke that smelled like burned flesh, but she was unharmed. One expert said that SHC could be the result of internal electric currents causing a spark that ignites the body like a wick. Well, one skeptic was like, eh, yeah, okay. Once again, Ed Warren would have had some answers. I'm no expert, but it sounds like demonic possession to me. Now, which demon? That I can't answer without knowing more. My knowledge isn't specific enough. But some demon out there had to be involved with this. I know this is a redundant statement to most, but throughout history there have been multiple paninis that have brought the entire world to a standstill. Well, we all know about the most recent one. It turns out that one of the least known ones is the sleeping sickness of the early 20th century. To be specific, between 1915 and 1926, around the same time the influenza thing ravaged the world, a sleeping disease claimed the lives of more than 500,000 people. Known scientifically as encephalitis lethargica, this disease left sufferers in a statue-like condition, unable to speak or move their bodies. In fact, some patients who survived it reportedly never gained full control of their motor functions ever again. Although the disease mysteriously just disappeared in 1927, scientists remain puzzled over its origin and cause, as well as how was this transmitted? I don't know folks, sounds pretty supernatural to me. Alrighty, we're ending today with another case I learned about from an Unsolved Mysteries episode. So two weeks after disappearing in 1989, Cindy James was found dead near an abandoned house with her arms and legs bound behind her back in a nylon stocking around her neck. An autopsy revealed that her actual cause of death was a not so fun substance situation, and the police ruled it a self inflicted death, which would be bizarre enough on its own had James not reported being harassed and physically attacked by an unknown assailant for the last seven years. She first received threatening notes and phone calls, discovered dead cats hanging in her garden, had her phone wires cut, her house was nearly burned down, and was attacked five times. Once in her home, where she was impaled through the hand with a paring kitchen utensil, and another time when she was found battered and suffered from hypothermia in a ditch on the side of the road. So the police, who they never dusted for prints, never thoroughly searched for evidence, they were like, hmm, you're making this up. Sure, because somebody's gonna go to those lengths to make up a story. A lot of that isn't even possible to self-inflict. So after her death, one doctor was like, oh, you know what, I think she's got multiple personalities, and one of the split Cindy's killed the other. If I'm starting to sound angry, it's because I am, folks. She was tormented for seven years and ended up dead. According to experts, this has always been a real puzzler, and it's like, hmm. Yeah, I don't, you don't say. It's really hard to believe that she could have taken the substances and then also hogtied herself. Look, I think we can rule out an accident. As for the multiple personalities claim, well, it's a theory. I know Ozzy Caban, the private investigator who worked with her for years, was absolutely certain she was being stalked and then she was killed. Her family didn't think she was having any psychological issues. It's just hard to imagine somebody inflicting that kind of pain, where there's actually a weapon going through her hand. The big question is, who would keep this up for seven years? Some folks really thought this girl was possessed, and look, I know Ed Warren would have absolutely proven them wrong in an instant and believed and advocated for this poor girl. He would have known this wasn't demonic possession or multiple personalities. And that's it for me once again, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident oogie spooky girly. And if you enjoyed my ramblings today, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hit the bell for more Ed and Lorraine chatter from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people. 